you can support In the Past Lane by buying some of our merchandise. We've got merch with quotations from famous people in history, like Abraham Lincoln, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history, and Confucius, who said, study the past if you would control the future. And we've got some snarky ones, too, like one of our bestsellers that says, Dear America, okay, I'm begging you, stop repeating this shit. Signed, History. You can get these designs and many more on everything from a t-shirt or a hoodie to a coffee mug or a beach towel. Just go to our website, inthepastlane.com, and click on Merchandise. Thanks. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. And the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Hi there. Welcome to In the Past Lane podcast about American history and why it matters. Brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International, and coming to you from the Black Wall Street Studios, located in central Massachusetts. I'm your host, historian at large, Edward T. O'Donnell, and this is episode 194. Every week here at In the Past Lane, I tell you what happened in U.S. history this week, with special attention to one important story. So what's going on at In the Past Lane this week? Well, last Friday, my college, Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts, held its virtual graduation ceremony, and the highlight was a surprise address to the graduates by Dr. Anthony Fauci, the infectious disease expert who's playing a major role in the effort to contain the COVID-19 pandemic. He's a graduate of Holy Cross, class of 1962, and he spoke very genuinely and fondly of his Jesuit education and how it shaped his life and career. I think our graduates were thrilled to hear from him, and I suspect he may return to Holy Cross for a live graduation before long. Also, if you're looking to buy a cool mask, to protect you and others from the coronavirus, all In the Past Lane t-shirt designs are now available as masks. So you could get one that says, well-behaved women seldom make history. Go check it out at inthepastlane.com. Just click on merchandise. All right, let's get on with it. Here's what happened this week in American history. Let's start with this. On May 31st, 1921, 99 years ago this week, Mobs of heavily armed white residents of Tulsa, Oklahoma, rampaged through the city's African-American district named Greenwood. They stole property, set fire to buildings, and indiscriminately killed black men, women, and children. When it was over, this pogrom, known as the Tulsa Race Massacre, left between 100 and 300 people dead and 35 blocks and smoldering ruins. It was one of the most deadly incidents of racist violence in American history. And yet... It was quickly driven from public memory. The years between the end of World War I in 1918 and the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921 were marked by many incidents of extreme anti-black violence. This surge in violence was due to many factors. The end of World War I brought a massive strike wave as millions of workers walked off the job. Fear of socialism, communism, and anarchism surged as the nation plunged into one of its periodic red scares. Also contributing to the social tension was the fact that millions of African Americans had, in the previous decade, moved to northern cities, part of what historians refer to as the Great Migration. Chicago's black population, for example, jumped from 44,000 in 1910 to over 110,000 by 1920. And on top of this, the Ku Klux Klan had re-emerged in 1915 as a vibrant national organization that by the mid-1920s would have 5 million members. Each of these trends contributed to surging anti-black racism that led to many incidents of violence against African-American individuals and neighborhoods. In 1919 alone, there were 25 major anti-black riots in the United States. One of the worst took place in Chicago in July of 1918 that left 38 people dead. In addition, 76 African-Americans were lynched in the South in 1919, including 10 black soldiers who had returned from active duty in World War I. Up until May 1921, Tulsa, Oklahoma had been relatively peaceful. But it was an oil-rich city of 72,000 that was strictly segregated. In fact, when Oklahoma was admitted to the Union in 1907, the very first laws passed by the state legislature imposed segregation and disenfranchisement upon its black population. Despite these Jim Crow laws and a climate of racial hostility, Tulsa's African-American population was one of the most prosperous in the United States. In fact, the Greenwood section of Tulsa 
where most African Americans lived, was nicknamed the Negro Wall Street, or Black Wall Street. It was filled with thriving Black-owned businesses ranging from barbershops and retail stores to law firms and doctor's offices. Many white citizens of Tulsa resented this Black economic success. And it was this resentment that escalated the situation on May 31, 1921. Like so many incidents of anti-Black racial violence in U.S. history, this one began with an incident involving a Black male and a white female. On May 30th, a 17-year-old girl named Sarah Page, who operated an elevator in downtown Tulsa, accused 19-year-old Dick Rowland of assaulting her. Rowland was taken into custody and brought to the local courthouse downtown. The next day, partly inspired by an inflammatory article about the incident in the local newspaper, a large crowd of angry white men gathered outside the courthouse. It was a scene that was a typical prelude to a lynching. Not surprisingly, rumors that Roland was about to be lynched raced through the black community, prompting a large group of armed black men to arrive at the courthouse. A standoff ensued, and then shots rang out. Which side fired first remains an unanswered question. But both sides exchanged gunfire before dispersing. The clash left 12 dead, 10 white and 2 black. Immediately, word of the incident spread throughout the city. Within an hour, large crowds of heavily armed white men gathered and it was very clear what they were planning to do. And yet, the city's police force did nothing to stop them. In fact, research would later show that police officials handed out weapons to members of the mob and that many officers joined it as it descended upon the black community of Greenwood. As the attack began, many African Americans managed to flee the district. But many were trapped and murdered by the mob. Some were shot, and others were stabbed, and still others were consumed by the flames set by the arsonists. Members of the mob also looted homes and businesses before setting them on fire. The violence lasted all night and into the morning hours of June 1st. It ended only when a large contingent of the Oklahoma National Guard arrived to impose martial law. Some 35 blocks of Greenwood were completely destroyed. Damages were estimated at over $2 million, the equivalent of $32 million in 2020. Adding insult to injury, local officials and National Guardsmen rounded up nearly every African American in the city and placed them in hastily constructed detention camps. All were treated as perpetrators rather than innocent victims. Some were held for weeks before being released. And then there was the death toll. The official death toll was 36 African Americans killed. But African American leaders at the time claimed that the number was significantly higher, well over 100 and perhaps as high as 300. They also claimed that white officials, in an effort to cover up the enormity of the massacre, had hastily buried hundreds of black victims in a mass grave. And the cover-up worked. The staggering death toll, along with the city's complicity in allowing the massacre to take place, were soon purged from public memory. At least, white public memory. African Americans certainly didn't forget the trauma and loss. But in this era of Jim Crow, they were powerless, unable to obtain any justice or public recognition of the incident. And it stayed that way for 75 years. The city of Tulsa never put up a historic plaque or memorial, Its children never learned about the incident in their history classes, and the nation remained ignorant of this monstrous event. But the silence about the Tulsa race massacre began to break in the 1990s, as African Americans gained more political power and began to push for a full inquiry into the incident. In 1996, the 75th anniversary of the massacre, the state legislature created the Oklahoma Commission to study the Tulsa race riot of 1921. Note the title of the commission, It referred to the incident as the Tulsa Race Riot. This misnaming was significant and intentional. Nearly every massacre of African Americans by white mobs in American history has been labeled a race riot, a name that suggests an equal culpability between violent whites and violent blacks attacking each other. But in every case, these so-called race riots involved black communities being attacked by white mobs. Not surprisingly, As a more accurate and complete picture emerged of what occurred in Tulsa and other sites of anti-black violence, these incidents have been renamed to reflect what they really were, massacres. The commission worked for five years, taking testimony and funding research into the massacre. In 2001, it released its official report. Among its many findings, the commission declared that Tulsa's political leaders had conspired with leaders of the mob to allow the massacre to unfold without any resistance by law enforcement. It also recommended that reparations be paid to any survivors and their descendants. City and state officials balked at the call for reparations, 
but the state did establish a scholarship program for descendants of victims and survivors of the massacre. It also provided funding for historical markers and a memorial park, which was completed in 2010. More recently, just a few months ago, the story of the Tulsa Race Massacre was made an official part of the state of Oklahoma's public school curriculum. And the search for the truth about what actually happened and how many people were murdered on that day continues. Just a few months ago, researchers announced that they had found several sites in Tulsa that appear to contain mass graves. Plans are in development to excavate the sites to determine if they contain victims of the 1921 massacre. If they do, it will likely clarify the true death toll. Finally, the Tulsa Race Massacre garnered headlines this year when it was featured as the starting point for HBO's hit TV series, Watchmen. I suspect we're going to be learning more about this episode in American history in the coming year. So what else happened of note this week in U.S. history? May 25th, 1787, the Constitutional Convention officially opened in Philadelphia with 55 delegates in attendance, including George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and James Madison. Over the next four months, they drafted a new constitution for the United States to replace the initial Articles of Confederation, which had been deemed weak and ineffective. May 25, 1977, the blockbuster film Star Wars opened in theaters. And it's entirely possible that the 13-year-old version of this historian at large snuck into a theater with his girlfriend to see it. May 26, 1924, President Calvin Coolidge signed the National Origins Act that sharply restricted immigration for the next 40 years. It not only shrank the volume of immigration from as many as 1 million immigrants per year to about 200,000, the law also intentionally discriminated against undesirable immigrant groups like Jews and Italians. It was eventually replaced by a more equitable immigration law in 1965. May 30, 1922, the Lincoln Memorial was dedicated in Washington, D.C. And what notable people were born this week in American history? May 26, 1895, photographer Dorothea Lange. Her most famous photograph is Migrant Mother, which captured the desperate face of a struggling mother and her children during the Great Depression. May 26, 1926, jazz trumpeter Miles Davis. May 27th, 1794, railroad magnate Cornelius Vanderbilt. May 27th, 1907, writer and marine biologist Rachel Carson, who helped launch the modern environmental movement with her book, Silent Spring. May 29th, 1917, the 35th president of the United States, John F. Kennedy. And May 31st, 1819, poet Walt Whitman. Okay, time for the last word. Let's give it to Walt Whitman, who was born 201 years ago this week. In the preface to his masterful collection of poems, Leaves of Grass, Whitman urged his readers to free themselves of ideas, conventions, and traditions that suppressed their true selves. He wrote, Re-examine all you have been told at school, or church, or in any book. Dismiss whatever insults your soul, and your very flesh shall be a great poem and have the richest fluency not only in its words, but in the silent lines of its lips and face, and between the lashes of your eyes, and in every motion and joint of your body. Well, that's going to do it for In the Past Lane this week. You can learn more about me and everything we talked about at InThePastLane.com. And let's interact via social media. I'm at In the Past Lane on both Twitter and Instagram, and our Facebook page is in the Past Lane Podcast. See you next week. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. Mm-hmm.